Father wants to work in each of us today. He does every day. Whether you're at church or not, he's working in our lives to do something good for us or in us to help us to make our, our life better, to make our walk with him more productive. And I believe that today he just wants to help us in our thought. It's a very simple, simple thought, and I'm just thinking out loud when I make these statements, but I'm wondering as we sit here today, how many of us truly like what we see in the mirror? When we look in the mirror, you know, the older I get, the less I want to look. I'm like, okay, I have to walk by a mirror. I just don't even want to look in it anymore. There's too many changes going on that are not my favorite thing, you know, the thing. Gavin sat down by me the other day in on the couch, and he kind of leaned up against me and looked up at me and said, Nanny, how come your hair's getting gray stuff in it? Thanks, Gavin. That's what everybody who perceives himself to be a teenager still wants to hear. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. And I said, well, it's just what he said. Are you getting old? <laughs> Didn't help a bit to hear that, you know. But I wonder, you know, do we like everything that we see about each other, our face, our eyes? our hair, the color, the texture, even when you're young. You know, why are plastic surgeons making billions of dollars? Because most of humanity, a majority of us are not satisfied with what we see when we look in the mirror. You know what? If this nose was just a little bit small, if it didn't have that bump right there, or if it didn't stick up on the end, or, or if, you know, if, if I just didn't have these wrinkles, would it hurt to just go get them stretched back into a mask, you know, where I look like, like I've been in a machine, or, you know, would it hurt to get rid of this double chin, and would, would it hurt? I, I, I just don't, you know, we look in the mirror, and what we see, we're our worst critic. Now, I have met a few people who I thought they probably needed to go with a little criticism to the mirror, the way they strutted around and they weren't all that. But, you know, most of us, when we go to the mirror, we're not really thrilled with what we see. Our shape, our skin color, our nose, our lips, our smile, our teeth, our clothes, you know, probably several women in this place tried on a few outfits before they settled on which looked right for this morning. Because it goes on the way you feel in that thing that you put on. And, and then you try to imagine what other people are seeing when they see you in that thing you're going to wear. And so, I mean, a bed can just be laden with clothes. That was, It was a clean bed when you started getting ready. But when you walk out the door, there's clothes and hangers piled all over the top of it because nothing seemed right. Nothing fit. Mirror, mirror on the wall. And I think that... Um, Many of us have heard people say, you look so much like your mother, or you, you look just like your dad. I can see your father. And you. you and your sisters are just alike. And I've, been, I've had the occasion to call a businessman when we were trying to settle my mother's estate. I had to call an attorney, and my sister, Vanjie, had already talked to him and surely had been to his office. And when... I, enter, I said, I'm Joni Larson from San Diego with the Haney Trust. Oh, you sound just like your sister. You, you know, we have that. And then now, 
the older I get, I have people go, oh, you look just like your brother. Oh, my goodness, you look just like him. And I'm like, really? My brother? I mean, I thought he was handsome when he was young, but the older I get and the older he was, now we're starting to look alike. This is scary, you know. And then my husband, he loves to do this to people because we draw associations about people. When we meet somebody, we like to associate something so that we remember or we have preconceived ideas. The simplest statement can make an idea. And my husband loves to tell people that my mother was born in Japan. And you, you'd be amazed how many people go, oh, I thought you looked Japanese. <laughs> It's hilarious. I'm like, really? <laughs> I'm embarrassed to embarrass them and tell them, oh, they were just missionaries. <laughs> you know, it is, it is amazing what the mirror tells us and what the reflection of our physical uh, body tells people about us or what people think about us. Well, in thinking about that, I was thinking, and I, I'm not speaking about stands of holiness or separation today, but why do some companies have a uniform and set standards for their company? And I'm not just talking about dress, but I'm talking about uh, conduct as well. Because they know as soon as people find out who you work for, you are a reflection of their company. And when they come in, when I go into a bank, now, used to, everybody was in business suits. Even the women were in very dressy clothes, the tellers. Now, polo shirts, T-shirts, maybe with the name of the bank on them. But they still have something that identifies them as a worker for that bank. Even though it's casual wear now, there's some defining identity mark that makes them a reflection of that institution and that bank. You know, um, they're a reflection of their company. So today I want to talk about reflections. And I just simply titled it Mirror, Mirror on the Wall because you remember the story of Snow White, uh, the, the beautiful and yet very wicked stepmother and she had a mirror that she could seek counsel from. And she would go, and you know the famous statement, mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest of us all? The famous quote. And she looked in the mirror, but she looked in the mirror to assess her fleshly desires and to receive personal praise. Her reason for seeking the reflection and asking the mirror was purely to bolster up her moral thought about herself and her own beauty instead of looking at it to see who she might be reflecting. She was looking at it for the wrong purposes. And reading from that mirror and seeking counsel from that mirror purely for her own ego and her own pride. Speaking uh, of Jesus, let's look at our text from Ephesians, the first chapter, verses 11 and 12. And I have it for you there in the revised edition and then from the book's translation. In whom also we were made a heritage, having been foreordained according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we should be unto the praise of his glory, we who had before hoped in Christ. Now the reason I want to read it in the book's translation is because it defines what this is talking about. In him we were also chosen, having been predestinated according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of or the reflection of his glory. He desires us 
to be the reflection of his glory, not the reflection of ourself, but the reflection of his glory. And the first thing that I want to establish is that our Father God put his spirit into us so that we would shine forth as a reflection of him, of his beauty and his glory. The purpose he put his spirit in us is not just to satisfy us. But this scripture says so that we would be to the praise or the reflection of his glory. So that others would see that we would reflect him, not just for, I know the spirit, the Holy Ghost is the comforter. There's many things that the Holy Ghost is for us, personally, individually, reasons to receive it. It's there to lead us, to guide us, to help us. There's all kinds of reasons that the Holy Ghost is so important for everyone to have. But this scripture says one of those reasons and the main reason for the Holy Spirit is that we will be a reflection of him. Because if his spirit is in us, then naturally what is in you reflects or comes out from you. Your innermost thoughts, you may hide them for a while, but eventually... People will know them even though you don't speak them because you will begin to reflect those thoughts in the things you do and the attitudes you take on and the expressions you emanate forth from that come forth from you. People will kind of know what's going on in your head because what's inside has a way of working out of us. And so when we take on the Holy Spirit and we are full of the Holy Spirit, one reason he gives it to us so that we can go through this world and be a reflection of Jesus Christ. What does it mean to reflect? And I have it there on your handout for you. It means to send back, throw back, or cast back. Like snow reflects light, it sends it back. Indicate, show, display, demonstrate, or be evidence of. Be evidence of. Register, reveal. Reflect means to reveal. You know, I can ignore how I look all morning long. But when I walk to the mirror, it reveals to me how my hair is sticking out all over the place, how I forgot to wipe the sleep out of my eyes, all of those things. Oh, I need I need to do this. I need to do that. Oh, I look horrible. The mirror reveals how you really are. I can walk not look in the mirror. If I don't want to know. But most of the time, I need to know before I open that front door and put my foot out on the on the front step. I need to go by the mirror first because it is a revealer. The mirror is a shiny surface to show the an image of. Reflect means to Bring about a good or a bad impression. A good or a bad impression. His spirit must reflect in and through me. Not just an inward reflection, but in and through me. Why? And we find a strong answer in 1 Corinthians the 11th chapter, verse 7, verse 14, and 15. And again, I want you to know I'm not speaking on stands of separation. This is not the lesson for that. But there's an important principle found in these scriptures. Let's read it. 
in the Good News Bible, 1 Corinthians 11, 7, says, A man has no need to cover his head because he reflects the image and glory of God. But woman reflects or is the glory of man. We reflect glory. We reflect glory. In the, the book's translation, which sometimes I like to cross-reference through many translations, it says a man ought not to cover his head since he is the image and glory of God. But a woman is the glory of man. Does not the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him, but that if a woman has long hair, it is her glory, for long hair is given to her as a covering. We are the glory of God on this earth. We are the glory of God, not just woman, but man. Man is the reflection, the image the glo of the glory of God. Glory means a state of great splendor or magnificence. It means brilliance. Glory means brilliance, distinction. You are the distinction, the brilliance of God. You and I are the reflection of the glory of God to this world. It, glory also means honor triumph, grandeur. That's what we, our lives, should be reflecting. Because when people look at us, the mirror image they see should be Jesus Christ. That's who we are told to reflect, to be the glory of, to be the splendor, the magnificence, that when people see us, they're seeing the magnificence of God. It may not be that we're beautiful. I remember years ago, a girl came to Bible school, and I grew up in Stockton, and from the time I was old enough to walk, when we'd have a preacher, to visit, my mom and dad would take them out after church and they'd leave my sister and I with the girls in the dorm. And they would play with us like we were their baby dolls. And as we got a little bit older, they'd let us wear their high heels up and down the halls of the dormitory. And we'd, we'd be doing all these crazy little things, you know, in the, in the dormitory. And uh, we would be, you know, kind of carry this stuff out when we get home. We'd tell mom and dad, oh, so-and-so does this and so-and-so does that. And, you know, little tattletale Pentecostal preacher kids. We'd tell everything we knew that went on in the dorm. And my mom and dad, oh, really? Oh, oh that's interesting, you know. And I was not a very good reflection of my mom and dad because my mom and dad never talked about anybody, but I talked about everybody when I was little. It was interesting to see their lives and to tell what went on in, in the dorm and who liked who that nobody knew about. And, oh, she has this and she has that. And, and um, you know, there would not be much of a distinction between my thought process and the silly girls in the dorm. When we all got older now, I wouldn't think of going in there and putting on their high heels and praying up down the hall. And, but I wanted to reflect them. I wanted to be like them. I'd see them sashay into church, and they'd sit down, and, and, and they'd look over at the boys, and they were kind of, you know, because there was a bunch of boys and a bunch of girls. This was a Bible school. And I'd think, oh, when I'd see him fall in love, oh, and I'm just a little girl, oh, it was so romantic to me. And I wanted to be like that. And I, I wanted to attract the boys the way they did. And oh, weren't her shoes pretty? And, you know, we get caught up in spiritual life, too, with people who have gifts and people who have talents and people who have, 
we forget that we're not all given the same gift, all given the same talent. What we are asked to do is to stay full of the Spirit and reflect the glory of Jesus Christ, to let it emanate from us, its brilliance and its honor and its distinction, to be the magnificence of his glory. Notice the references to glory in the writings of the apostles. 2 Corinthians 3.18, but we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory as in a mirror, we all, as if looking in a mirror, see the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same or reflect that image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. The good news says it like this, all of us then reflect the glory of the Lord with uncovered faces, and that same glory coming from the Lord, who is the Spirit, transforms us into his likeness in an even greater degree of glory. Now that happens when we're given to him. That happens when our life is taken up with him, and he is the center focal of our life. When we look in a mirror, we may not see the glory of God. When I look in the mirror at home, that's not what I see. In my humanity, I'm critically appraising my own humanity. But when I leave that place, if I have spent time with him and I step out into public, they should be seeing a reflection of his glory first before they're assessing my physical appearance. The glory of the Lord should be, this is what the apostle said, should be emanating from us and reflecting the glory of Jesus Christ to a greater degree. If you study anything about God, you can't help but know that his glory is important. From the Old Testament to the New Testament, that word glory is always used in conjunction with God. And it's always used in a reflective type sense where God's glory is important to him and it should be important to us. It should be reflect that importance should be reflected in our lives. Even in the Old Testament before they had the Holy Ghost, the glory of God was important and that people gave him the glory and lived in honor towards him was so important to him. There were times that his glory filled the whole house, the, the tabernacle, the place of praise, uh, Solomon's temple. Those places were filled with the glory of God. He made his glory so powerful that mere human beings could hardly stand in the presence of that glory. And yet he tells us that he wants us to be a reflection of that glory. And I wonder for myself, I won't even talk about you, but let me talk about myself. Am I in his presence enough? that his glory fills me so much that that is what people sense and see in me. His glory is so important to him that he wants it all. He said, my name is the Lord and I will not share my glory with idols or with men. He doesn't give his glory to other so-called gods. Other humans. The only way we can tap into that glory is to be filled with his spirit. And he puts that glory in us so that we reflect him to the world. That's the purpose of putting the glory in us. 
so that we are reflection, a beaming. I don't know about you, but when I think of glory, I just get a, a just a big shine, something that just is brilliant. It's magnificent. You can't even hardly look at it because it's so wondrous. And that's what he wants to put in us. I'm not talking about us going around, love, love, so full. And we're just trying to invoke that glory and make people see it on us. But when we live in his presence, it is a natural thing that we don't even have to seek after. It comes into us and reflects from us. And he wants us to be to the reflection of his glory. Now, since he has placed his spirit in us, his spirit in us, he says that we are the glory of him. And when we look in a mirror, do we radiate glory? Radiate simply means to send out rays. It means send out rays or waves of illumination. That's what radiate means, to send out waves or rays to illuminate. When I have his spirit in me, do I radiate his glory? When I walk by people, am I sending rays of his illumination into their lives without me even speaking. That's probably the apostles, Peter, Paul, when they walked by people, they were healed just with the radiant glory of God coming from them because they were so, they were endued with power from on high and they kept that alive. And I can't, again, speak for you, but let me speak for me, and maybe it will help you. I know with the cares of life that surface every day and sometimes several times a day, I can get caught up and caught away into other things where I am no longer conscious of God. I have kind of taken a few steps away from being endued with power from on high, all of a sudden the flesh has started taking over. The flesh wants to meet the need of the situation or whatever has come up, the trauma. I almost have more at times, and I'm talking about me. This may not be you, so you can hear my, my admission here. I almost have more trust sometimes in myself than I do in God because I'm going to fix some things when they come up. I, I just got to go fix it. I can get, you ask my husband, I, I have a fiery temper. I may not have red hair, but I have temper. It comes from something red down in here, I'm supposing. And I can blame it on being Irish, but I probably have a less than a thimble full of Irish in me. It is just humanity. And then fear. If it's not anger, it can be a situation that brings forth fear in me. And all of a sudden, I'm backing away from just being totally open and compliant with God, and I'm going to fix it, or i got to run from it, or i got to figure this out, or i got to... You got to fix it. Looking at my husband, you got to fix it. You know, and out of where did that empowerment, where did that glory that I experienced in the prayer hour in the morning, where did that evaporate to? Sometimes that endowment, but see, the, the apostles, they had their moments of humanity. I, I can kind of read it when I read the script. I can kind of see it coming forth occasionally. But on the whole, 
They were so caught up with getting this gospel to the whole world. And they were so caught up with ministering to the needs of people and getting the church going. And for, they were in prayer. They were in prayer. And they were talking God. They were talking about Jesus. They were explaining. They were just caught up. Yeah, they were singing too. And just kind of in the background. It was just going forth. You know, the truth of the matter is we live in a fast-paced world. We're not walking around leading our donkey, going somewhere, taking our time, talking to people as we go, just talking about the Lord, talking about the Lord. We're in the car racing, and people jerk in front of us, and the Holy Ghost goes, Boop, because we just go, and we say it, and we're mad, and we're just, you know, it just, we're living in a crazy world. Maybe I'm the only one that thinks that, but it is nuts. It's nuts out there. And all day long, we are being buffeted. And that's why it's even more important. I'm finding, for me, it's more important to walk in the Spirit all day long. Because if I don't, by the time evening comes, I'm not a nice person. And by the time evening gets here, I'm mad at the whole world. I'm upset. And I don't want someone to say to me, are you the lady that prayed this morning? Scratching their head. I really want to be that lady. I want to live that life where I'm empowered, endued with the power of God so that regardless of what's happening, I can radiate the glory of God. Because I want to be a reflection of him in every situation. Not just at spiritual moments when I'm here at the church. Not just when I meet a saint in the mall and they yell, praise the Lord. And I, I, there's no place for me to hide. So I have to, you know, radiate the presence of God and put it on if I don't feel it. No, I want to really have it all day long. We should see the image of him by his glory that's in us. In fact, the glory should radiate more powerfully and more powerfully the longer his spirit lives in us. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says, what we see now is like a dim image in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. What I know now is only partial. Then it will be complete, as complete as God's knowledge of me. The NIV says it like this. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. But when we look in the mirror, we only see a reflection of the things of God. Then, but someday we're going to be face to face. What is that saying? Someday I'm going to be face to face with God and I'm going to see him in all of his glory. But right now, the glory I see is when I look in the mirror. The reflection of his glory. Is it there? Someday I'll be face to face. But now am I radiating enough of that glory for other people to see it, for the world to see it, for me to see it, for me to feel it, to know. Here's some uh, questions to reflect on, maybe to reflect on often. Is what I know about God what I see when I look in the mirror? Is, is it what I see when others look at me? Or what they see when they look at me. When they look at me, do they know I know about God? And not just because of the way I dress. Like I said, businesses have uniforms. It doesn't mean those people know. Any. Have you ever walked up to somebody and they're in a uniform and they cannot give you one answer about what's going on in that place? And you want to say, who hired you? This happened the other day. I asked about a question about something on a menu. Well, no, I have to go to the kitchen and ask them. And I'm like, it was a simple question. 
And before I could say another thing, they ran off to the kitchen. And I'm like, I didn't even get to give you my drink order. And I had been waiting already. They come back with the answer. And I, I made the mistake. Well, is that, uh, oh, I don't know. And they went on, oh. My husband looked at me and said, don't ask another question. Don't ask. You know, and I'm the person, he sits down, his bottom touches the seat, he knows what he wants. He don't even have to look at it. He may never have been there. He doesn't have to look at a menu. He's just going to tell them what he wants, and they better produce. If they can't produce, then he'll tell them something else. Me, I have to look at the whole menu. I have to ask every question, and he sits down and he goes, are you ready yet? No, you're going to ask him a question, aren't you? He says, Vince is the same as you. He asks questions every time we go to a restaurant. I said, I like my food a certain way. I want it the way I like it. I'm not going to pay for something that's not what I want. If I'm paying, they better fix it like I want it. But I have to know. Oh, I don't want some dumb plate coming out to me, and it's, it's not at all what I thought it was. I want to know. So, you know, you can wear a uniform. You can wear clothes that make you look like a Christian, certain apostolic kind of Christian. But are you and I really reflecting? that Holy Ghost, that these clothes tell people I have? Or is it just clothes and I'm reflecting myself and my old nature? So these are questions kind of to ask yourself. Is there a dim reflection of Jesus in me? Or is it brilliant? I know someday I'm going to see him face to face, but right now, is there enough reflection in me for the world to see him? In my home, on my job, at the grocery store, on the road of all places, are they going to see Jesus when they look at me, hear me speak? It's kind of a scary thought. And it's something to start governing our lives by. Stay full of the Holy Ghost, but also practice the disciplines that Jesus taught us. Temperance and love and kindness and goodness and mercy and gentleness. Meekness. Moderation. Peace. That doesn't mean just have peace in your heart. That means practice peace. Be peaceable. Be good to people. We are his children. James 1, 23 through 25. Whoever listens to the word but does not put it into practice is like a man who looks at his reflection in a mirror, sees himself as he is. He takes a good look at himself and then goes away and once and at once forgets what he looks like. But those who look closely into the perfect law that sets people free, who keep on paying attention to it. And if you have a pen, would you underline that? Keep on paying attention to it. In other words, you read the word, you study the word, and you keep on paying attention to it. You don't just read it and forget about it. And do not simply listen and then forget it, but put it into practice, James said. Reflect it. Reflect it. Reflect the word of God. It says they will be blessed by God in what they do. Do you want your life in what you do? I, I do. I want it to be blessed by God. And his way of that happening is for us to stay full of the Spirit, to get in the Word and then not walk away and forget what we read, but apply it and pay attention to it and read more and pay attention to it and begin applying His Word 
to our lives. The more we interact with him, that's prayer and communication. Prayer and interacting with him. The more we interact with him, the more we study him or read his word and meditate. That study goes beyond just briefly reading through a chapter. A child can do that. But reflecting on and meditating on it. The more we surrender to him or give myself over to him instead of my own way. Oh, I'm going to go here. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do this. I'm learning. I'm learning. I was raised in this, and I'm still learning that when I go somewhere, when I need something, pray about it before I go look for it. And he will direct me. Tell him what I need. Tell him what I want. Follow the direction of the Spirit. The more we surrender and give ourselves over to him. Lately, I've made up my mind. I tell him what I want, what I need, because I used to love to shop. Oh, my goodness. I could shop the legs off of anybody. And now I abhor it. I have no idea what changed, but I don't like it. I don't like to waste my time. I just don't have time going from store to store to store to store. I just, oh, what a waste. There's so many more things to do. All the men are saying amen right now. I know they are. Sorry, women. I'm not the perfect wife. My husband can tell you that. But I don't like to shop. And I usually only go when I have a need. And I'm learning to pray and say, God, just take me to the right place. I just need this. I just need a simple this. I just want, I, I want to get it over with and go home. I don't want to waste my time here. And I tell him what I want. And I, and I tell him, if it's not there, I'm not buying a second best thing. I just want what I need, and that's it. Because I want to be surrendered in my spirit. He may be saying no. The other day I went someplace. I was trying to get some cool clothes for the Philippines because it's hot as Hades over there. And I wanted something cool. I needed some cool things. And I told the Lord what I needed. And I walked in this store. He didn't tell me to go to that store. I just had good luck there before. Walked in this store, and I pulled out a few things. Oh, that's kind of cute. Okay, maybe I'll get it. And then I heard him say, don't settle. Put it back on the shelf, went home. I said, honey, I know where I need to go. You're not going to like it, but I need to go to Steinmart. And he took me up to Steinmart. I found everything I needed right there, one place, gone, out of here, done. You know, I know that's a silly little, little illustration, but part of reflecting his glory is to surrender to him. And when he speaks to you and says, no, don't go there. No, that's not the place to go. No, don't do this. Whether it's shopping or whether it's getting a loan for a house or whatever it is, if you'll listen to his voice, he will lead you to the right place. He wants you to reflect his glory while you're there. So he has people there that need the glory of God reflected on them. He wants to take you to the right place, and me too. So part of it is surrender. The more we reflect on him... The more we reflect on him, his glory and his greatness, the more we should take on his image. The more we reflect on him, the more we will reflect him, in other words. Romans 8.30, and so those whom God set apart, he called. And those he called, he put right with himself, and he shared his glory with them. That's amazing. Have you been called of God? Be a Christian? He's, he wants to share his glory with you. He said, I won't give my glory to another, but I'll share it with my people. And they can reflect me. They can reflect me to this world. His excellence should be clearly seen in us. His excellence should be clearly seen. 1 Peter 2.9, but ye are an elect race, a royal priesthood. He's talking to you. 
Hey, he's talking to you. He's not just talking to preachers on the platform. He's talking to you. This is written to the church. You are an elect race. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. He wants to possess you. It's hard to possess something that keeps trying to get away. Isn't it? So you ever pick up the, you know, I got grandkids, so I'm in toy stores occasionally. You ever try to pick up those slippery things? You pick them up, and they slide right out of your hands. They're like this tube full of water with a little fish swimming around in them or something silly. And you pick them up, and whoosh, they just plop right out of your hand. They just, that's how a lot of Christians are. You got me, God, fill me with the Holy Ghost, whoop, and they're, they're just gone. Don't, oh, no, don't hold on to me. Oh, no, God, I got my thing to do. Yeah, I'll be a Christian, but I'm going to do it my way. No. We're God's own possession. He wants to possess us that ye may show forth or reflect the excellence of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And the Amplified says it like this. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a dedicated nation, God's purchased special people that you may set forth the wonderful deeds and reflect or display the virtues and perfections of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We should be a reflection of his wonderful deeds, that scripture tells us. We should be a reflection of his wonderful deeds, of his virtues, of his virtues, of his perfections. See, he's perfect. We're not. But when his spirit comes in and begins to work on us, we should start reflecting him not us. The world should see him and his perfections, not us and our imperfections. What should be on display when others see us? Not our dress, not our jewelry. That's what Peter was saying in the third chapter, his first letter when he wrote to the wives. Even he wrote to the wives concerning women who had unsaved and carnal husbands. And he said, you can win them without preaching, nagging, or having conversations with them about their conditions simply by living a life that speaks louder than ornaments, seductive apparel, or gaudiness. You can win them by your life that's full of the glory of God because those things are not what draw people to God. It doesn't draw people to Jesus Christ. It may draw people to you, but not to him. And the whole point is he wants to reflect through us so we draw people to him, not to us. It's not our physique. It's not our sanguine personality that draws him to God. It's the glory of God emanating and reflecting from us. It is our spirit, our sweetness, gentleness, goodness, obedience, our attentiveness that draw. That's what that scripture says in Peter. That's the things that draw people unsaved people to God is our spirit and our sweetness and our gentleness and our goodness and our obedience and our attentiveness. Those are things that people are drawn to. It's not our dimples. It's not our loud laugh. It's not our name brand shoes and purse, our car, our straight teeth, and none of that draws people to Jesus Christ. It makes you feel better when you look at your reflection in the mirror. But it's not the reflection of the glory of God. What must be on display is Jesus Christ. That's what the world should see. 
Jesus Christ when they see me. I want them to see him. If they see Joni Larson, they've seen the wrong thing. They've seen a prideful mess. But if they can see Jesus Christ, then they're drawn to him. I'm not suggesting you shouldn't care how you look. I think that is very important that we represent him well in how we conduct ourselves, how we look, how we behave, how we our expressions on our face, all of those things. But I am suggesting that every day if we interact with him, if we study him, if we please him, if we're full of his spirit, these are the things that will be noticed about us. Colossians 3, 9 through 11. Do not lie to one another, for you have taken off the old self with its habits and have put on the new self. This is the new being which God, its creator, is constantly renewing in his own image in order to bring you to a full knowledge of himself. As a result, there is no longer any distinction between Gentiles and Jews, circumcised and uncircumc uncircumcised, barbarians, savages, slaves, and free, but Christ should be in all, and Christ is in all. Psalm 119.5, the psalmist cried out and said, Oh, that my actions would consistently reflect your decrees. Oh, I think all of us could cry that out from our soul. Oh, that my actions, even at home in private, would consistently reflect. Titus 2.1, as for you, Titus, promote the kind of living that reflects wholesome teaching. Promote that kind of living living that reflects is a reflection of wholesome teaching romans 12 2 do not be conformed to this world or this age fashioned after and adopted to its external superficial customs but be transformed or be changed by the entire renewal of your mind by its new ideals and its new attitude so that you may prove for yourself what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God, even the thing which is good and acceptable and perfect in his sight for you. One more scripture. 1 Peter 1, 14 through 16. Live as children of obedience to God. Do not conform yourself to the evil desires that governed you in your former ignorance when you did not know the requirements of the gospel. But as the one who called you is holy, you yourself also, be holy in all your conduct and manner of living, for it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. The scripture infers that we are to reflect him in all of our ways of living. All of our ways of living. This is in private. It's also in public. It's with all others. It's with family, friends, coworkers, acquaintances, and strangers. We should reflect him in all of our manner of living, in all our communicating with others, in our attitudes, which means our demeanor or our manner, in our responses. Can you imagine Jesus going off hurt and sulking in a corner? Can you imagine Jesus getting mad and flying off the handle and yelling and screaming and slapping one of his disciples? Can you imagine Jesus doing a dirty business deal? You know, anything you can't imagine Jesus doing, we should not be involved in because we're a reflection of Jesus Christ. We are a reflection of of Jesus Christ and our time is up. I said one more scripture, but I do have one more from Philippians 2. Do everything readily and cheerfully. Oh, why did they have to add that word? No bickering, no second guessing allowed. Oh, I know why they asked me to do that. Yeah, I know. I know what they're trying to do. I got and you're second guessing. Yeah, I know. I know them. Second guessing. 
go out into the world uncorrupted. Not that the world's uncorrupted. We're to go out into the world uncorrupted. A breath of fresh air. We're to be a breath of fresh air in this yucky, horrible, polluted society that we live in. Provide people with a glimpse or a reflection of good living and of the living God. When they see us, they're supposed to get a glimpse of the glory of God and what good living for God is all about. Carry the light giving message into the night so I'll have good cause to be proud of you on the day that Christ returns. You'll be living proof that I didn't go to all this work for nothing. In other words, reflect, reflect, reflect Jesus Christ. God bless you. Have a great week. Reflect Jesus. Stay in his presence enough that you can reflect him when you walk out into the world. God bless you.